risk, right? Okay, here we go. <laughs> we all fear sexual betrayal. You've met people that are intense, right? You ever have a, you meet somebody who's charming and fascinating and you're like, they want to be friends with me? Why? This is the best. <laughs> I never, I never knew anything about sex as a child, which is probably for the best, but uh, <laughs> There was a science talk that I received when I was seven from my stepmother. Uh, she pulled out the World Book Encyclopedia. And <laughs> we went through the plastic flimsies that if you stack them, they turn into a person. But it's like organs and muscles and bones and nervous system. And there was one for women, there was one for men. We took a tour. It was very clinical, very sciencey, but informative. A little early, but informative. On um, 9 to 11, I did what uh, some kids will do. I played a little bit of a you show me yours, I'll show you mine kind of thing with the neighbor boys. Um, and that was uh, essentially garage, strip poker. I <laughs> I'm training for action so that I had an extra layer. <laughs> <laughs> then I went to college and I started doing stand-up comedy. And... Um, there were some nice guys, there was some date rape, and uh, there were one night stands on the road. And the only boyfriend I had, a uh, very, very quick boyfriend, took care of the virginity issue. And then, um, and then all the guy comics that I hang, hung out with were, we all, we, uh, they did one night stands. So I was like, well, that's what we do. That's what we as comics do. We have one night stands. And uh, there were older gentlemen, older people who did stand up comedy who were married. But they got laid on the road as well, so, uh, hmm. So I was like, that's what we do. And I've never known really how to have relationships because my, my parents seemed happy enough to me until they weren't. And then, uh, and I knew, and I didn't know that my friends in high school and college, that those were my friends. Those are my friends. Because uh, I met Kelly, who made all those friends seem superficial, but friends are the people that you stay up late with and talk about philosophy and stuff like that. Friends are not the ones that you drink with and then end up in various degrees of undress. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive if you discuss philosophy with your drinking buddies and then whatever you're undressing, that's all between you and them, but that's fine. But I, those were the two things I did. When I, I met Kelly, a friend of mine, uh, <laughs> She made all those friends seem superficial. She's a comedian as well, and but she was the successful woman comic when we first started doing stand-up comedy. And she had so much charisma. She didn't even really do comedy. She didn't really have friends. She just people, she had so much charisma, people wanted to work with her. She had so much charisma, she was essentially raising an army. She was looking for disciples. I became a disciple. I joined the army. I was in. And um, and there are comics who talk filthy, who are filthy, filthy comics that audiences love. Old women laugh because they have so much charisma. Greg Fitzsimmons, Doug Stanhope are hilarious, hilarious men that, that old people, I mean, if you look at their material objectively, there should be picketing. But, <laughs> but you can't, I mean, and that's the kind of material she did. I would do one of her jokes, but that isn't done. So, um, just think of like the smartest, dirty jokes you know. Those were the kind of, that was the kind of comedy she did. Uh, and she all made it seem very effortless. And then she, and she gave back to the community as well. She, um, she always had a project, someone she saw potential in. And she'd take them under her wing and bring them out and make everyone who wanted to hang out with her, hang out with them. And I was one of her projects, I was her project. And we started hanging out at the club initially and we started, and she never had a car, so I would drive her around. And um, she had a daughter, I remember her daughter, and, uh, and we started hanging out all the time. I took time off my job eventually to drive her around. And we went drinking and did shows and I babysat for her when she had dates. I was a great help in the single motherhood issue, but um, I was also her project. So she taught me things. She taught me like how to wear makeup and how to dress better <laughs> than this is better. And <laughs> work out. Uh, you tell me that. Because whenever I would go clubbing in college, I was always the wingman. You know, I never got the guy at the end of the night. I was the reason my friend wouldn't leave with you, essentially, right? I mean, I was the excuse. It was great. And it was fine. It was, it was 
But Kelly had made it a point to teach me to be the one to get laid. She, you know, I think the first guy, she, she tried to get me to pick guys up. Like she could just, they just flocked to her. But eventually she would just pick up an extra one for me. And um, <laughs> I think that one of the first guys she ever set me up with was an ex-boyfriend. And I'm sure, I, I know that the, con she was blunt. I'm sure the conversation was like, Dave, really, you should sleep with Jackie. I'm sure she's great. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because she couldn't sleep with all of the guys that wanted to sleep with her. She could not. There were just too many. And um, so she picked one up for me, and when she didn't want to sleep with anybody, like any of the guys that were available, she wanted to sleep with me, which is weird, right? I mean, we're super drunk, laughing and talking and about boys and clothes and comedy, and we're drunk, and she leans in and kisses me. And, you know, and I kiss her back because she's Kelly with the charisma of the sun, right? <laughs> and so we start making out. And, and that counts as my lesbian experience. You know, so it wasn't really sexual, or it was sexual, because we made out a lot. And but we didn't make up because I was the spare, essentially. And it was like it was sexual, but it didn't feel like any other. I mean, there's there's a disconnection when you when you get laid, right? When you sleep with strangers. But this was even a weirder disconnect because we were workmates. Like we, there were times when we were sober, hanging out and just hanging out. But so it was weird and disconnected. And, I don't know, but I never thought of it as like a sexual relationship. I thought we were best friends. And I thought that's what best friends were, I guess. And then I made it weirder. Yes. Um, <laughs> I tried to figure out how to make her life perfect. I tried to figure out, oh, well, we're best friends and this is what we're doing and we're in our each other's lives so much. How can I find more money and more time to be with her and be, I must have been the neediest friend she'd ever had. And, but I was the neediest friend she ever had that also had a car and a job. So she started working harder to make my life more perfect. Doomed, so fucking doomed, so doomed. And so she was doing whatever she could do for me, getting me, getting the club to book me, teaching me how to dress, to get laid. I never got good at getting laid. I, I look back at it and I think it's just, I don't like to sleep with strangers. And, um, and she was still getting laid, went out. And when I was with her and she was pointing all that charisma at me, it was, I felt weirdly safe. But more and more often, because I was so needy or so there, so right fucking there, she would turn it away from me and turn it towards other people. And it was, but when she got laid, she wanted me to be there as well for some reason. Not for threesomes all the time, but it was, we'd end up in her apartment with the kids sleeping in the other bedroom and she'd want to have sex with some perfectly nice gentleman. She always picked a very nice gentleman. Uh, <laughs> but she'd insist that I not leave. So I'd be in the freaking room, like disoriented and drunk and mad and sad and jealous and confused. And, and I'd lie there in the dark just listening to her have sex. I'd be drunk, almost to passing out, dry sobbing in the corner, pathetic. <laughs> but new. Interestingly new, right? <laughs> a whole new experience to learn from. And I started to tell her that I didn't want to be there. You know, oh, please let me drive home drunk. Please, please, please. And then that's when she started encouraging me to go live my dreams. In LA, go to LA, she'd say. You don't have kids, she'd say, go, go, she insisted. <laughs> She's like, one of us should be living our dreams because she never left the Midwest, she never left. She was weirdly in stasis. She couldn't move. She was paralyzed by, it's weird to think of her with low self-esteem issues because she has the charisma of like Oprah, John Kennedy, you know? I mean, it was like, so I moved to LA. And when I, and I tried to keep up this weird long distance relationship with her where I would call and say, hey, I'm doing this, what are you doing? She wouldn't, she stopped taking my calls and she was like, oh, I'm busy, you know? She had a new project, essentially, probably. And, and I'd come back to visit, I'd come home, and uh, we'd go out to lunch, and it was sort of like regular friends, you know? And she had a driver's license by then. And, but then it was like, one time I came to New York, and I saw her previous project. I got to meet, uh, I met with Mary. We knew each other. And, uh, and we were sitting at lunch, and I said, isn't Kelly weird? And I just, that's all I said. And Mary stands up and says, I'm the worst friend ever. And that, and she storms out. And Kelly's never talked to me since. And Mary's never talked to me since. But then my pity about Mary, because we were the same size, and she had better taste in clothes than I did. And I still have a very nice dress that she was sick of. Anyway, um, 
The last time I saw Kelly, though, she pretended she didn't know me. Like, I went back to the Midwest, and I'm at the club, and there's a bunch of comics hanging out, and I go, hey. And I was like, hey, Kelly. And she ignores me, and everybody else says hi. And I was like, Kelly, thinking that she had not heard me. Uh, I go, hey, Kelly, hey. No. Third time. Third fucking time. Hi, Kelly. And nothing. And finally, because essentially, it was like, OK. Maybe that's what she does with everyone. That's like a defense mechanism, right? Is sort of, and she's vilified me. I'm the bad guy now. And I, maybe I was. I was very, very drunk. I very easily could have been the bad guy. I have no memory of many of those drunken, super intense days. But I'm a relatively sane grown up now. Like I have other, I've met other people who are mesmerizing. And, uh, and I embrace my inner jackass sometimes because she was like, essentially she was acting in a movie of like, Chief Wright, show profiled ex-friend. Anyway, but it was, um, <laughs> I was, I, I know what that weird, petulant childhood activity looks like. I sometimes act weird and petulant and childlike. So I see, I knew what she was doing, so I just went, hey, Kelly, it's Jackie. You remember, Jackie Cation from our, such things as our past. And, <laughs> <laughs> asshole in the room. She burst out laughing and looked me straight in the eyes and said mesmerizingly, yes, Jackie, hello. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it was weird to have felt that intensity of like love and obsession and fear and self-worth and self-loathing all in one package and then to not and to have been cut off. It did, I don't really think about it when I'm not around her. I don't, whatever, and I don't think about it. But when it's pointed at someone else, like when you're by the sun and then it's pointed at something else, you just, it, it, it's a learning experience, you know? I feel like it was an apprenticeship, not to actual real love or friendship, but an apprenticeship to learn how to not get sucked into a cult. Uh, <laughs> because it's affected how I think about friendship. You know, this is probably 10, 15 years ago now. And I had to relearn that friendship is fun. You know, it's supportive, it's not constantly one dramatic event after another. And I'm still working on letting people be friends with me. I don't feel like I'm really good at it. But my friends are charming, lovely people that know how to give and take and yet not consume someone. And it retarded any real relationships with men that I had for years. Um, because to really win back from that, you have to learn how to love yourself, right? You have to learn to trust somebody else and let them love you, or even like you, or even be nice to you. You have to open yourself up to something like that. And it's not easy after feeling like you're slightly or greatly sexually tortured, uh, emotionally or sexually, or, but to have sex with a good guy after that, to let yourself have sex, it's hard, you know? You have to learn experience, anyway. I met my husband consciously. I wanted a boyfriend. I did online dating. Flipping drop down menu option. I'm a woman looking for a man to date. <laughs> <laughs> tapity tap, tapity tap. You go to the Starbucks, you look at each other for the first time, and one of you goes, no. And you, you go home and you do it again and again and again. You meet someone who isn't horrified by your initial appearance. It's just that romantic. Anyway. Um, <laughs> We dated, though. But when I met my husband, we dated. And we dated and we dated. And I told him pretty early on in the dating that I didn't want to have casual sex. We didn't have to hire the caterers. But I, I needed him to be my boyfriend. It had to be monogamous. That's what I wanted. And he was like, OK, I completely understand. And so we dated. We did, then we did more, two more weeks of dating. Dating, food, dinner. Like, and we'd go out to meals, and then we'd watch a movie, and then we'd furiously make out. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, the makeout part of any courtship is not to be underestimated, obviously. It's a fantastic time, and, uh, and it's good times. And you eventually learn more about each other by dry humping than anything else, I'm sure. But, I mean, so, <laughs> but eventually, everybody, you know, I remember, like, the last time I said, we're making out furiously, and I'm like, do you want to be my boyfriend? And he said, yes, of course. And I said, allow me to get a condom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, God, let us do this. <laughs> and when he told me 
that he loved me. We were in the car. We're in the car. We're driving. And he goes, I love you. And I looked at him and I was like, I think I love you. Because <laughs> I could trust him enough to say that. And he knew me well enough to say, you love me. <laughs> I know it. And my friendship with Kelly was weird. I feel like she gave as much as she could to anyone, you know? And I got to learn a lot about the whole friendship thing. I got to, because now I know I can recognize when I meet someone who gives me that warm glow of well-being when I'm with them, tinged with this constant fear that I'm not doing enough, that that is not ever going to be my friend. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot.